Hey friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to watch this special message today. I'm Pastor Daniel, and I want you to know I look forward to meeting you one day in person. If we were a blessing to you, let us know. You can comment, you can like, you can interact with other people watching online. It sure is fun for us to see you developing community online. Hey, lean in and get that pencil out because I believe the Holy Spirit's got something special for you today. Thank you very much. The title of today's message, A Handful of Honey. Have you ever met someone or maybe you, you know of someone or maybe even just peripherally, you see these people and they've just got such a bright future. They've got so much talent. God's favor is just dripping upon them and and you know that they've just got a bright future in store. But over time, tragically, you've seen these very same people waste it all. Uh, you, you may think of somebody that's maybe famous, like a, a Marilyn Monroe or a, a Whitney Houston, uh, maybe a James Dean or an Elvis Presley, maybe Amy Winehouse or a Kurt Cobain, or maybe in the younger generation, the young man from One Direction, Liam Payne, who just died so tragically over the past a uh, few weeks. But we look at these people, or maybe, again, you may even know somebody personally, and they have all of this favor, and they have all of this gifting, but they just are willing to, to let it all walk away, or they're willing to, to lose it all for a quick hit, or another high, or another temptation. And these people just can't see beyond what is right in front of them. They just cannot see beyond that, that lust, or that that, that temptation, that, that, that drug hit or that pornographic website, whatever it is, and they're willing to just lose it. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be in a series on the life of Samson. If there was anyone in the scriptures who represents that or who represents the American bravado, it would be Samson. Samson had everything that a man could want. He had hair and he had strength. <laughs> he had wit and he had women. He was so strong that the men wanted to be him and so good looking that the women, they wanted to be with him. But he was also extremely weak where it mattered most. He just couldn't say no, even though it was killing him and eventually did kill him. If there was ever a testimony of tragedy, a testimony of what might have been and, and could have been and should have been, it was Samson. He was a legend whose story has become a laughing stock. And his life serves as a constant reminder of what happens when we live for the now and we just can't say no. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to make the commitment to be in church over the next four weeks. I also want to encourage you to bring all the young people that you know to this sermon series. If they can't come here physically, maybe you can send it to online to them digitally because I do believe they're gonna need this message series. I'm also working off the assumption in here today that most of us know a little bit about Samson. His accomplishments are legendary, but so are his weaknesses. God had given him so much power and so much potential, but again and again, through one small bad decision after another, he eventually self-destructs. So I just wanna summarize Samson's life in one statement. He was an incredibly strong man with an incredibly weak will. Let me say that again. He was an incredibly strong man with an incredibly weak will. Now, Samson's story is given to us in Judges chapter 13, verse 16. I need to set the context for you for just a moment. Um, this is a period in time when the Israelites just can't stop rebelling. They just can't say no to whatever pagan God or whatever pagan custom is, is in their life. Now, the thing is, they, they left Egypt and they'd entered into the promised land, but they just can't stay faithful to God no matter how faithful he had been to them. So time after time, God would send a judge to help them. The reason why he would send a judge to help them is they did not have a king just yet. It was known as a theocracy, meaning that God was in charge, but yet he would lead through priests and through prophets and judges. Now, a judge was primarily a name that was given to the ruler who is providing over the affairs of the Israelites day to day during the transitionary period after the death of Joshua. 
And let me just stop right there and say, Joshua was a great man. He was a man of integrity who did great things, but he did have one downfall. And his downfall was he did not name a successor. In other words, he did not put anybody in place after he was gone. As a result of that, the people keep doing what's right in their own eyes. So this is a period between Joshua and the, the ascension of King Saul. It was a period of complete anarchy and confusion. If you want to summarize the book of Judges, we can actually go to chapter 2, verse 16, when it said, the Lord raised up judges, and whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge, and he saved them out of the hands of their enemies. And here's the key phrase, as long as the judge lived. You see, as long as the judge lived, the people lived a life of integrity. But as soon as the judge died, the people would go back to doing what was right in their own eyes. In fact, the theme for the book of Judges is the people continually do what is right in their own eyes, including Samson that we'll see here in just a moment. And finally, God had had enough of this, so he puts them under a Philistine rule and oppression for 40 years. Now, you may remember the Philistines because Goliath was a champion of the Philistines. But as God always is from Genesis to Revelation, he is gracious, he is loving, he is kind, and he is forgiving. And he finally says, enough is enough. So I'm going to raise up a man by the name of Samson, who is the 13th judge of Israel, to deliver you. Interestingly enough, I was reading my devotion this morning, I think in it was Isaiah 59 through 63, and I found something very, very interesting. It uses two phrases. It says the day of the Lord's wrath, and then it says the year of the Lord's favor. Do you see a difference there? So many different times we think God is judgmental, and God is condemning. He just can't waste to bop his people in the heaven they do wrong. But it says there's one day of wrath, but 364 more days of God's favor upon your life. So I don't know what you're going through right now, but I do believe more is in store because God is always a God who wants to give more love than he does judgment. All right, let's pick up the story in Judges chapter 13. Again, it's like, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless and able to give birth. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and you do not eat anything unclean. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is to never be touched by a razor. That is not me. I apologize. I did not take the Nazarite vow. <laughs> because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. In other words, Samson is to be different. He is to live by what the Bible calls a Nazarite vow. You can read about the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6. But essentially, it was a way that a, a, a non-priest, somebody not from the Levite family, an ordinary person like you and I, that we could make a vow to be set apart for the use and the glory of God. And it had essentially five features. Number one, it was voluntary, meaning that, again, anybody could make this vow. Number two is it didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. You could, you could say, I want to be used for the glory of God. Number three is it had a specific time frame. Number four is at the end of that time frame, they would come and they would offer a special offering to God. But the fifth aspect of this is it actually carried three specific vows. The first vow was this, no alcohol, no grapes, no California raisins, no Coronas with a little lime, no wine at dinner time, no Cinco de Mayo margaritas that only cost a dollar and a dime. You stayed away from alcohol. Uh, number two, the vow was don't touch anything dead. Why? Because that's weird. <laughs> it's gross. And it's unsanitary. <laughs> the third vow was this, and this is very important. Don't cut your hair. Now, let me stop right here because I do feel this is from the Lord. Is it okay if I feel something that is from the Lord today and I say this to you? Yes. Two of you are going to allow me to say something from the Lord today. Where else do you want me to say it from? 
This is what I'm going to say from the Lord. Evan, you said I can't. I don't know what hairstyle Samson had, but I can promise you one hairstyle he did not have. Samson never had a mullet or he never had an Arkansas waterfall. I feel that it's from the Lord today because those are ugly, they are ungodly, and they always have been. Even if you wore one in 1992 because you thought you were Billy Ray Cyrus, uh uh-uh. Even if you had one in 2002 because you were kin to Joe Dirt, he was your brother and your cousin, uh uh-uh. Even if it's 2024 and you have renamed it the Freedom Flap, it is hideous and you need a holy haircut in Jesus' name. Does anybody else need to receive that today? Now let me stop right here and say, we are a church for all people. We are a hospital for the mentally unstable. So please, there is grace for your mullet today. You can be forgiven and you can be healed in Jesus' name. But the only way that you'll win is if you confess, it ain't cool and it ain't never been cool. (laughs) Anybody else want to receive that from the Lord today? (laughs) Um. But all of these restrictions were for a purpose. Uh, Let me explain it this way. Just like baptism is an outward and visible testimony that there's been an inward and spiritual change. Um, Just like my my wedding ring is an outward and visible sign that I have been committed to Miss Amy. These restrictions are an outward and visible sign that Samson was set apart for the use and glory of God. And now because of this, God's hand was on him and God's strength was with him. So much so that Samson could kill a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey and rip a lion apart with his bare hands. Yet, no matter all this external power, he was internally, spiritually, emotionally powerless against temptation. And it eventually took everything he had. Again and again and again, he squanders his future for short-term fun. And how many of you know that tragically, that same thing still happens every single day? There's a little bit of Samson in all of us. I have seen men who can commit to their careers yet cannot commit, figure out how to commit to their wife. I have seen men who have studied for hours to find the best TV to buy, or studied for weeks on end to find the best person to, to draft in their fantasy football league, yet can't spend five minutes studying God's word. An hour listening to their wife or an afternoon interacting with their kids. I've seen so many men that love their wives, yet are locked in a prison of lust and they're too afraid to ask for help. I have seen women who love God and they love their their husbands, but they can't keep their spending habits in check or they cannot overcome their insecurities or their constant comparison to other women. So it robs them of trust and intimacy with their husband or contentment with their kids. We all know people with so much potential and yet time after time, they are self-destructing because of one small bad decision after another. Samson lost everything and he eventually gained nothing. And the question that we have to ask today is how in the world could this happen? And Samson has three very specific attitudes that he displayed that we have a tendency to display too that will make all strong people weak. And here's the first one. The first attitude is lust. Now, when I say the word lust, the first thing that normally or maybe even naturally comes to mind is sex. But the reality is lust could be anything. And lust is a very tricky thing because it's not so much a problem to be solved as more as it is an appetite to be managed. May I explain that to you? In the appropriate relationship, or maybe even in the appropriate setting, lust is a good thing. You don't believe me? Without it, you wouldn't be here. Okay, so for instance, in a healthy marriage, lust should be alive and well. But when lust is more focused on its desire than the potential consequences of that desire, It is then when it violates God's law and other people's rights. So let's go to Judges chapter 14. 
One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. Everyone say caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Notice he says, I want to marry her. Go get her for me. I want to draw your attention back to that phrase, caught my eye. You see, everybody that is in here today battles with temptation. We all have something that catches our eye. And whether or not we are able to resist that temptation depends on our ability to understand exactly what it is, how it works, and ways to avoid it. So what comes to mind when you hear the word temptation? For some people, it might simply be a hot fudge Sunday today. For other people, it could be a six pack of beer after work or a bottle of wine after a hard day. For others, it might be a coworker or a person at the gym. It could be fudgy numbers, it could be a site on your computer, or it could be a TV station, a channel when no one else is around. And asking ourselves what comes to mind when we think of the word temptation is actually a very important question. Because usually whatever comes to mind is what we find ourselves struggling with. And temptation means different things to different people, but in the end, it is essentially saying yes to something that we should be saying no to. And regardless of what you've heard out there, no one just falls into temptation. It doesn't happen by accident. Because what we are doing is we are bypassing responsibility and not taking ownership. Because have you ever noticed that nobody falls into doing something good? Yeah. Oh, just fell into blessing my neighbor today. No, it was your decision to bless your neighbor, but it was not your decision to fall into sin. So that's what happens is we are bypassing responsibility and we're bypassing. So we don't just fall into it. It doesn't happen by accident. Now, the most basic definition of temptation is the opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. Our temptations or excuse me, our desires in and of themselves are not sinful. It's how we fulfill those desires that makes them sinful or not. Let me break it down this way, explain it to you. For instance, Eating is fine. We need food to survive. But we could also all agree that eating too much food is unhealthy. Uh, wanting to escape the pressures of life is a good thing, right? That's why we have hobbies and that's why we have recreation. There's nothing wrong with that. But taking drugs or abusing alcohol to do it is now what makes it bad. Okay, let me say it this way sex is a gift. And it's a good gift. But outside the boundaries of marriage, it's a sin. And what I need to tell you today is, we do not become more like Jesus by having less desires. Desires are like water. When water is controlled, it's a great resource. However, when you take away the boundaries and you take away the control, such as the banks of the river, you get a swamp. Or even worse, you might get a flood. You see, the power of the water is actually found in the control of it. And desires become uncontrollable when they have been deceived. It was James, the little brother of Jesus, who described it this way. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. But when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. James says that when we let our desires go unchecked, they end up leading us astray. And he uses an illustration that I think most people in here today are familiar with, and that is a fishing lure. You see, temptation is like bait on a hook. In fact, that is exactly what the word entice means, to bait the hook. Now, you may not know this part, but fish don't bite empty hooks. That's why fishermen hide the hook with bait. But we call it a lure. And a lure is anything that looks like something that a fish would normally desire or normally eat. Now, this is important. The fisherman catches the fish by appealing to its natural desire to eat, which is why the bait or the lure works so well. That is why the enemy with temptation always appeals to a natural God-given desire. Case in point, Samson. 
Samson was a young man who wanted to be married. Is there anything wrong with that desire? But the Bible says he was not to marry the Philistine. Philistines were pagan idol worshipers. But she caught his eye. And lures almost always have something in it that catches the eye. And wisdom for a child of God takes the time to look beneath the flash to see, is there a hook? Is Lee evil lurking? Because underneath every desire, in the wrong circumstance, in the wrong relationship, is the potential for a dangerous hook. Can I break that down personal with an illustration? Something that I've told you guys before. I have never drank alcohol. And it's not because I necessarily think alcohol is wrong. But I will look at my family and my past. It is a family of addicts. My past or my genetics is filled with people who become addicted to alcohol and have seen it ruin their marriages or ruin their lives multiple times over. So for me, I'm looking, is there anything that I can become addicted to? Is there any hook that I need to become dependent upon that will eventually cost me? So I'm not necessarily saying that alcohol, alcohol is wrong, but it is wrong for me. It's what alcohol leads to, which the Bible says is debauchery. Debauchery by its very definition is anything that causes you to lose control. And I think even you as a parent would say, anything that causes us to lose control is a bad thing. And that could be many different things. I've also chosen not to watch rated R movies, except if Sylvester Stallone is in it. I'm gonna be honest right now and I'm gonna confess that to you guys. Do I think that watching rated R movies is a sin? Not necessarily, but I'm looking beneath the surface and I'm asking myself, is there anything I've become addicted to? Is there anything that could hook me? Because another word for hook is actually addiction. And wouldn't you agree with me that America has become a nation of addicts? And that's why the apostle Paul said, listen, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is edifying. Just because it's good does not mean that it's good for you. So you cannot be deceived into taking the bait because every time you take the bait, you're going to get hooked and bad things will happen. James says it eventually leads to death. Come on, pastor. Are you for real? You saying death? Absolutely. No, 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 pastor. Most of the time, the fishermen, they throw the fish back. That's true. And the fish may even say, oh, that tasted good. That was such a fun fight. And they even got a free kiss at the end. <laughs> and sure, that'll happen a time or two. But I promise you, there will come a day when that fish isn't thrown back. If it keeps taking the bait, it's either going to end up on a wall or it's going to end up on our plate. So don't be deceived into giving in to every evil or every desire. Samson said, I see it, I want it, go get it for me. I'll do whatever it takes to get it. You see, anytime you find in your life that you want something so bad that you'll do whatever it takes to get it, when you want something so bad that you forget about every bit of logic to go get it and you never think about what you'll lose when you'll get it, trouble is coming. And again, it could be a million different things. It could be a man or it could be more money. It could be a cute coat or it could be cutting quarters. It could be fudging numbers or it could be fooling around on social media. And too many people give up long-term peace for short-term satisfaction. And please listen to me. The enemy always works short-term and God is always working long-term. Even though now yells louder, the consequences last longer. Let's read on. His father and his mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in her tribe or among all the Israelites that you can marry? So he's got godly people speaking to him. Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. He leaves home. He travels to an enemy territory to pursue a woman that he's been forbidden to marry. 
And in that moment, he looks at her, he forgets about his vow, he forgets about his gifting, he forgets about his anointing, he forgets about his strength, he forgets about everything that God had given to him. He says, I don't care what God says, I don't care what my dad says, I don't care what my mom says, I don't care what's right, I don't care what's wise, I don't care what I lose, I'm a man and I've got needs, I want it, so go get her for me. And that lust now leads to the second attitude that makes strong men weak, and that is entitlement. Not only do we want it, but now we believe we deserve it. I know that y'all have never said this, so, so let's just breathe easy. I'm not talking directly to you, but I at least know that you've heard somebody say this. I work hard all day long, so I deserve it. Now, again, you don't have to feel convicted here because I'm not talking to you. You've never, you've never said, I've wrestled with the kids all day. I deserve this. Can we just say it together? I deserve it. One, two, three. I deserve it. So as Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lady suddenly, a young, excuse me, a young lion. Ooh, about got in trouble on that one. A young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. Men, can we say, that's stinking awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother, but he's already hiding it, which is usually a sign. When Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked with the woman. Can, can I speak to the young men in the room? Young men, I know that I've been at you a little bit. Can I speak to the young men? Because I really want to help you guys. Young men, are you listening to me here today? Do we have any young men in here under the age of 18 that I can speak to directly in here today? All right, I got a couple of them. I'm gonna speak to the middle crowd right here because listen to me, this, I'm gonna give you guys some wisdom. It is worth the money that you pay to get in here for this wisdom I'm about to give you guys. <laughs> and the old men are gonna shout me down here in just a moment. It said he talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. He said, okay, what happened? She looked good. Mm -hmm. Bible says that, she looked good. But he still needed to know if she was crazy or not. Because <laughs> men, you know, cute don't overcome crazy. Because beauty is skin deep, but crazy is to the bone. When beauty falls off, that crazy holding on. So listen to me, young men. Have I said any young men in here for you today? Some men like, I wish that somebody would have told me that when I was young. You got to talk to her, find out she's crazy or not. Later, when he returned to Timna for the wedding, oh, this is good. This is so good. He turned off the path. Everyone say, turned off the path. To look at the carcass of the lion, someone said, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. You see, anytime you start heading off the path, you are headed for trouble. Turning off the path took him by the vineyard, which had grapes. There he killed the lion. Had he not walked so close to temptation, he would have not violated two of the three vows he had made. You see, we live in a society where it's just too easy and it's too convenient to turn off the path. We've got apps and we've got the internet and we've got message systems at our fingertips and the devil is in that device that is in your pocket. You have to stay on the path. Don't entertain temptation. Don't flirt with it. Don't walk in its path. Don't make it too easy for you to give in because anytime you step off the path, you are headed for trouble. Just this once is never just this once. And once you give an inch, you might as well have gone a mile. Stay on the path. And he found a, uh, that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. He scooped up some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother, and they ate it. But he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. Two things, two, th two things. Number one, that's just nasty. <laughs> Can we agree? <laughs> Eating money out of a dead carcass? Sin causes people to do some nasty stuff, y'all. Yep. Right. You don't believe me? How does a man with a mullet determine if his underwear is clean or dirty? <laughs> oh, you know what he does. He sniffs it. <laughs> yeah, don't lie, don't lie. Y'all can be convicted by this. And then he just turns it inside out and he wears it again. That's what a man with a freedom flap does, y'all. <laughs> you ain't gonna forget that. Okay, look, let's make it more practical. How does a man who's married to a Swedish bikini model end up with a waitress at Waffle House in a back alley named Tiger Woods? I'm not judging. 
people who work at Waffle House, but y'all ain't been to the one in Joplin, Missouri, or you'd feel the very same way. <laughs> Sin doesn't cause you to trade up, but wallow in the pig pen and do some very disgusting things. It's nasty. Number two, it, one thing leads to another. He walked by the vineyard. He killed a lion and he hid the sin. For what? A handful of honey. And people still give up something of substance for a handful of honey every single day. Because we think we deserve it. Here's number three. Pride. As his father was making his final arrangements for their wedding... Samson threw a party at Timnah, as was the custom for the elite young men. The Hebrew word that is literally translated party is mishta. It means a drinking bachelor party. Samson is about to get married, so he calls his buddies. They say, tap the keg, man. Let's get this party started. That's the custom of the day. Here's the reason. You see, Samson thought he could handle it. And that attitude is still what brings strong people to their knees over and over again. I can handle this. All of us know somebody that could say, that said, I could handle this. But what they thought they had handled ended up handling them. Because we can fast forward to the end of Samson's life. The strongest man who ever lived had his eyes, his eyes gouged out. He's bound and changed and he's mocked and humiliated by 3,000 of his enemies. And that is what lust and entitlement and pride do to a person who's not strong enough to withstand temptation. It will mock you and it will mock your name and you'll become the butt of all jokes. You are only as strong as your greatest temptation will allow you to be. Don't lose it all for a handful of honey. Keep the end in mind. But here's the good news. While the enemy loves to make strong men weak, God specializes in making weak men strong. You don't have to do it on your your own strength today. You can be a person of character. You can be a person of courage. You can say no. You can rewrite generations. You can be a godly parent. You can be a great spouse. You can do it. But say no to the small things. So you'll say no to even greater things. Listen to the wisdom of the people that God has placed in your path. And remember who you are. You've been called and anointed by God to do great things. And with God's power, you can be different. You can say no. But I understand in here today that some of you are facing a very real temptation. You haven't done anything yet. But you just need the strength to say no to what you're facing. Hey, wasn't that a wonderful message today? I told you the Holy Spirit had something in store for you. I wanna say thank you to all those who are given to our church. You are certainly a blessing, not only to me and my family, but to the entire Mountain View family. Thank you again for investing in Mountain View Church.